Hello ladies, gentlemen, boys, girls, innies, outies and in between us. My name's Dan and welcome back to another PAP Reports. It's Monday, May the 18th, 2020. Today we start with a report of how police constable was apparently forced to leave a mental health patient who was being sectioned in order to stop a man filming the interaction. The incident happened on Wednesday the 13th of May in Swindon. Police and ambulance were called to an address following reports of a man's safety and well-being where they proceeded to force entry to the property and then arrest the man under the Mental Health Act. The man filming, however, was asked to stop recording by a police inspector who then threatened to seize the man's phone for evidence if he refused to stop filming. Isn't it funny how it's optional? I mean, it's either evidence or it's not. You can't simply arbitrarily decide that it's evidence if the guy doesn't stop filming. A spokesperson for Wiltshire Police said, We were called to reports of the concern for the safety and well-being of a man. Officers and ambulance attended and the man was taken to a place of safety. While it's not illegal for members of the public to film others in a public space, there are occasions where the police will ask people not to. In this particular case, the man being filmed was vulnerable and there was concern for his welfare. So officers were trying to protect his privacy and any potential investigation which may have followed. We always urge people to be mindful of the circumstances they might be filming and any upset or distress which could be caused by their behaviour. Personally, I'd say that if the man was vulnerable, then all the more reason to record the police. It's not illegal. He wasn't on private property and ultimately it could have been argued that having a camera on is a good thing as the police know that they are being watched and although not always the case, they will be aware that any bad behaviour will be captured. I also have to say that the reports make it sound like the guy videoing forced the police constable to leave the patient. It's utter horse shite. The guy makes it makes it sound like the guy was not receiving the attention he needed because of the photographer when in reality there was about a dozen police at the scene and the ambulance service. So trying to make out the guy might have suffered somewhat because of the photographer is ridiculous. During the lockdown, we have heard the term COVID idiots loads when the mainstream media talk about people supposedly breaching lockdown restrictions. I now find myself wondering how many of those same mainstream media outlets will now apologise for calling people COVID idiots and start referring to the police as COVID idiots, as it emerges that all 44 charges brought against people under the Coronavirus Act were in fact incorrect. Prosecutors found that there was no evidence that the, that the cases involved potentially infectious people, which is what the Act was designed to cover. The Coronavirus Act allows people to remove or detain a suspected infectious person for screening and assessment, but a Crown Prosecution Service said on Friday that dozens of people have been wrongly prosecuted. National Police Chief Council announced that a total of 14,244 fines for alleged breaching of coronavirus lockdown laws were issued by police forces in England and Wales up to May the 11th. Martin Hewitt, the National Police Chief Council chairperson, said these were unprecedented circumstances in which officers were presented with new power within days of them being announced. This has all been done at pace and everyone in the criminal justice system has had to deal with a new body of legislation which has undoubtedly led to some confusion. We apologise for the mistakes but, but, has to be a but there doesn't there, all parties have worked hard to manage this new legislation as effectively as they can and to keep the public safe. He added, it is right that any errors have been quickly identified and are being corrected through the Crown Prosecution Services review process and are also prevented by the additional safeguards now in place. Officers have received additional guidance on the correct use of legislation. We will of course continue to apply learning as we move forward through the current health emergency. Here we go again. Have you not learned yet that guidance doesn't work for the police? They need policies set in place to protect them and us from them, you know, rather than giving them guidance that in almost all cases tells them to use their discretion and judgment. The National Police Chief Council says its figures show officers are taking a proportionate approach with only one in 5,000 people across England and Wales being fined. And I suggest that if you were one of those people, don't pay it, appeal it. If you haven't seen the video already, I recommend you check out the Crime Bodge video about the unlawful issuing of fixed penalty notices under the legislation. I'll link to that in the description. A Metropolitan Police Constable is under IOPC investigation after a man was tasered in Haringey, North London. It's reported that the man in his 20s was running away from the police when a taser was deployed as the man was climbing a wall. 
The man then fell and has subsequently been left with what's been described as life-changing injuries. He was arrested on suspicion of drugs at the scene before being taken to hospital where the doctors described his injuries as life-changing with reports suggesting the man is now paralysed. Whether that's permanently or temporarily is unknown at the moment. Sal Nassim from the Independent Office for Police Conduct said, Having examined a range of evidence, including body-worn video, witness statements and medical evidence, we have taken the decision that this is now a criminal investigation. The IOPC said the officer was being investigated under caution on suspicion of causing grievous bodily harm. Ah, West Midlands Police. Very popular here on the channel recently in a pack reports. In fact, one police constable more than others. You might remember this incident. Which led to this incident being made public. Well, it seems that Constable Redmist is the same constable that you are now seeing on your screen. That's right, after being suspended for two incidents showing excessive force, this third incident has now come to light, which is from footage taken on February the 27th, just two months before assaulting two other members of the public a day apart after punching one who was allegedly on a stolen bike, even though the bike stolen was black and his bike was grey, and also allegedly after the constable had already been told the bike had been recovered. And then a day later, punching and kicking a 15 year old lad who was stopped for a drug search after allegedly being seen acting suspiciously. Although in a video from February it looks like his partner was a male constable and in the two later incidents in April it appears that he had the same female partner with him, who we are still unsure whether she is being investigated for standing by and allowing it to happen. 30 year old Trevelli Wise was the man tasered in a February incident and has now made a formal complaint. He says he was an innocent bystander watching at the aftermath of a vehicle crash. Mr Wise claims he was ordered to lie on the floor and the taser was used on him when he failed to comply. He was apparently agitated and, by his own admission, refused to lie on the ground when told to do so. He alleged the police attempted to wrestle him to the ground and his t-shirt was ripped during the altercation. Mr Wise says he was detained at Perry Bar Police Station for 19 hours and then agreed to attend an anger, anger management course after being told he would face a charge of assaulting an officer if he didn't. He claims the nature of the assault was making the policeman flinch. I was at home, he said, and I heard a big bang. I looked out and saw a car crash. Me and my neighbours went to see. The policeman came up and told me to get on the ground. I wasn't prepared to get on the ground because I'd done nothing wrong. I was hit in the stomach and in the throat. I passed out. When you're being tasered, it's not a nice feeling being tasered in the throat is 10 times worse. Community activist Desmond Jadu called the police authorities to look again at taser training after the footage was aired on social media. Mr Jadu said, this concerns me because I'm hearing about allegations like this more and more. Having observed tasers of training, I do believe some officers are not following the training that they've been given. In this incident, there was no danger to the public. The incident appeared contained. Why discharge the taser? In recent weeks, more and more concerns have been raised by, to me by the African Caribbean community over disproportionate force and indeed relationships with police. I think it's too simplistic to blame the COVID pandemic. Historically, relationships have been strained, he said. What we're now seeing is an escalation because more people are speaking out. The fear factor is no longer present. In a letter to the forces, Chief Constable Mr Jadu stated, I did not see any de-escalation techniques for a man that appeared agitated or alarmed. The man did not appear to be placing any member of the public in danger, as indeed the video shows an observer present. The man had no top on and we know the impact that taser can have on bare skin. 
In an extensive statement, a spokesperson for West Midlands Police said, a West Midlands Police officer who is currently suspended by the force following two allegations of excessive use of force is now being investigated over a third incident. We have been made aware of a mobile phone video showing a member of the public being tasered by the officer in Hansworth. He was subsequently tasered prior to arrest and released with a conditional caution. Depending on the outcome of this investigation, the caution administered may be subject to review. The officer was suspended earlier this month after two allegations came to light. A complaint was received after the officer stopped a teenager on April 21st in Melbourne Avenue, Newtown. In the ensuing incident, it is alleged that the officer used unnecessary force in striking and kicking the young person. A further complaint relates to an incident on April 20th in Frederick Road, Aston, where two officers stopped a man they suspected was on a stolen bicycle. The man was detained and it's alleged the officer assaulted the man before he was released with no further action. The officer remains suspended and all matters are now being investigated by the IOPC. Maybe if you'd have taken action sooner, there wouldn't have been three assaults. An Essex police constable has been attacked as he was walking to his vehicle in Chelmsford at around 1.45pm on Saturday the 9th of May. Constable, who at the time was wearing his cap and uniform, was viciously attacked in an incident that has left him with concussion after someone threw an egg at him. I'm waiting to hear of the PTSD claim and 12 months paid leave, to be honest. It's said that the constable actually attended hospital after this despicable and unprovoked attack, which, by the way, is being treated as assault of an emergency worker. I see now why the police are always asking for extra powers. I mean, this kind of incident is certainly no yoke and could cause mental health issues that shall see police needing time off. I know, I know, I won't give up the day job, trust me. Last week I spoke twice about how three of the Rochdale grooming gang members who have all had their UK citizenships revoked have been allowed to move back to the area they committed the crimes in. In fact, on Friday I spoke about how one of Adil Khan's victims had face to face with him in an Asda supermarket. Well, I guess late is better than never, Rochdale MP Tony Lloyd has now demanded to know why the three members of the town's infamous grooming gangs haven't been deported even though they lost their right to remain in the UK two years ago. Rochdale MP Tony Lloyd is said to have wrote to Justice Secretary Robert Buckland on February the 20th, alerting him to strong rumours that some of these men are either living in or sometimes visiting Rochdale and that on at least one occasion a victim has come into contact with their former abuser. He asked for a meeting with the minister to discuss the frankly deplorable situation. Of course, blaming the coronavirus pandemic, the minister only replied on April 22nd, pointing out that probation service ceased to have involvement with convicts once their period in jail and subsequent time on licence expires, as is the case with the three men in question. All three, however, were put on the sex offenders register for life. But surely being on the offenders register would have details about the crimes, where it happened, etc. And the powers that monitor these sex offenders should have seen that their now addresses are in the same area as the where the crimes took place. Might even be the same addresses as they lived at previously. Surely that's a red flag. Mr. Buckland wrote, I do very much appreciate how distressing it will have been for the victims of these appalling offences to see or hear of the offenders living back in the area. Under current legislation, the powers of the National Probation Service ceases when the sentence ends, and this is the case for a number of those who were convicted in the offences for the offences in Rochdale. Whilst this does not mean that the offenders are free from oversight, they will remain, for example, subject to sex offender notification requirements, it does mean that there are no powers to prohibit the offender returning to live in the area in which they offended or where the victim lives. Wow. So offenders of some of the most heinous crimes are simply allowed to go back to where they committed the crimes, where the victims live, even after having their citizenship revoked and there's no powers to stop that. That's UK justice for you folks, best in the world. Tony Lloyd said, if I were one of the victims of the grooming gang, I would be furious at this response and I am furious on their behalf. I'm now requesting an urgent telephone call with the Justice Secretary to ask why deportation has not taken place and to see what steps can be taken to ensure these women do not have to live in fear of bumping into their attackers in their hometown. 
The Home Secretary previously refused to explain why the three men hadn't been deported. The Ministry of Justice declined to comment. Of course they declined to comment. They can't exactly say publicly that they're allowing this kind of thing to, play, to take place whilst throwing every available resource at issuing unlawful fixed penalty notices under unenforceable legislation, can they? And talking of unenforceable legislation, don't we just love it when we hear of one of those boys in blue getting the unwavering protection from their gang? Well, British Transport Police Chief Superintendent Eddie Wiley is one of those people. Wiley has come under fire recently after he travelled from Glasgow to his family home in Yorkshire during lockdown. Although being high up in the gang ranks, it seems permissible as, of course, they couldn't possibly do anything wrong now, could they? Wiley travelled 480 miles to his home in Yorkshire from Glasgow between March 21st and May 13th, but denies breaching COVID-19 regulations. In a statement, British Transport Police said BTP is a national force with its headquarters in London and as such, our officers are required to regularly travel across England, Scotland and Wales for essential meetings or as operationally required. In these instances, Chief Superintendent Wiley will stay at whichever address is most convenient. Oh, so it's all to do with convenience. Well, why did nobody tell us that before? If it's convenient for you, then of course you can travel and disregard the regulations, especially if you're the one supposed to be enforcing them. The statement continues. Crucially, the restrictions state that people should only leave the place where they are living if they have a reasonable excuse. This includes traveling for the purpose of work, where it is not re reasonably possible for that person to work from the place they are living. It would not be reasonably possible for Chief Superintendent Wiley to perform his role solely from either the Glasgow address or his home in Yorkshire. So a chief constable who spends his time in an office, not on the streets, can't do his job via teleconference, email or phone. <coughs> Bullshit! <coughs> Deputy Chief Constable Adrian Hanstock said, we are satisfied that there has been no breach of the COVID-19 regulations in this case and there will be no misconduct investigation into Chief Superintendent Wiley's travel or his leadership. Furthermore, Chief Superintendent Wiley is a highly respected officer and I have full confidence in both his integrity and his ability to perform his duties. But Scottish Labour leader Richard Leonard said the journeys suggest Mr Wiley believes there is one rule for him and one rule for the rest of us and the officer has serious questions to answer. Mr Leonard said British Transport Police officers are currently playing a crucial role as guardians of the lockdown. Alongside the Scottish Government and Police Scotland, the British Transport Police's message to the people of Scotland has rightly been to stay at home and avoid any unnecessary travel, he said. People across Scotland and the whole UK have made huge sacrifices during this time, including missing family funerals and spending precious time away from their loved ones. But it seems as if the British Transport Police's top officer in Scotland has failed to learn the lessons of the Catherine Calderwood debacle and believes there is one rule for him and one rule for the rest of us. This could have serious consequences for the British Transport Police's ability to police the lockdown, which could in turn endanger public safety in Scotland. Eddie Wiley has serious questions to answer. What can I say? Derbyshire police are currently asking the public for help in tracking down a dangerous and sex-craved individual whose crimes will leave you shocked and mortified. Derbyshire police said the frightening incident happened between noon and 4pm on Tuesday, April the 28th in Dale Road, Matlock, where a heavy goods vehicle had become stuck. After a passing woman in her 70s helped the HDV by directing them so they did not hit the bridge, one of the occupants left the cab of the lorry and approached the lone OAP. He then proceeded to thank her and gave her a peck on the cheek. Derbyshire police are now desperate to locate the man as they are classing the incident as a sexual assault. I mean, it's not like the woman couldn't have pulled her head away and said thank you, but no thanks. It's what happens to me all the time. Not when I'm trying to kiss old women. It happens when I try and kiss any woman. Derbyshire Police's tweet asking for witnesses was met with an assault of its own, with Twitter users left aghast by their request. One user said, such a ridiculous waste of resources and the man will be put through a lot of stress. 
at Derby's police. I already had zero confidence in Derbyshire police before reading this. They're just a bunch of busy bodies. Busy bodies. Another user said, kissing a 70-year-old woman on the cheek as a thank you is considered a sexual assault by Derbyshire police. So serious, it requires resources to interview the public for an incident that took place over two weeks ago. This must be the country's most ridiculous police service. And as the police got more and more public ridicule, they ultimately deleted their tweet and the press release on the incident from their website, offering no explanation. Now don't get me wrong, I understand that unwanted sexual, advance, uh, sexual advances are not a good thing. I mean, I'm literally fighting women off all day long. But we all have the ability to say no thanks. And then, and only then, should action be taken if someone continues after being told no. In her 70s or not, this is ridiculous, and the police will certainly not be gaining any more respect for this one. Jobless saxophone player Laurie Viorel Romensi, I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it, has been fined by Manchester Magistrates Court after being arrested for playing his instrument in a public place. Not a metaphor. 52-year-old Romensi was spotted once in April and twice in May when he was playing a brass instrument with a hat out in front of him in the city centre. Police spoke to him and told him twice that busking was not a reasonable excuse to be outside during a pandemic and told him to return home, Manchester Magistrates Court was told. However, on the last occasion on May the 9th, police patrolling on Market Street heard the saxophone being played and saw the defendant standing playing his instrument with a wicker bowl in front of him. The bowl was said to have coins in. Which kind of makes sense considering he was busking. Prosecutor Richard Greenhow, Greenhow? Greenhuff said Romensi had previously been asked by the police to return home on April 21st and May 1st, when he was seen on both occasions busking whilst playing a saxophone. On May the 9th, police heard a saxophone playing and they were looking on Market Street when they saw the defendant stood playing the instrument with his wicker bowl in front of him. When the defendant saw the officers, he began to pack up his equipment quickly. Officers noted there were coins in the wicker bowl and there was concern about the risks to the public, given the lack of reasonable excuse to be in Manchester. He was arrested. Now forgive me if you think I'm wrong, but if this guy isn't in a group of more than two people, then the coronavirus legislation is a bit of a moot point. There's nothing in there about whether you can go out or not. It's the advice that says you can be out with a reasonable excuse, and I hate that term. Either way, if he was trying to earn money to feed himself, then to him it would have been a valid reason to be out. Obviously, let me know what you think in the comments. Romensi was said to have no previous convictions. He was a man of previous good character. In mitigation, his defence lawyer, Rodrigue Landu, said that Romensi speaks and understands very little English and he simply did not have a decent understanding of the restrictions imposed due to COVID-19. He does not have a job or income. He plays a saxophone as a way of survival. Sentencing him, District Judge Margaret McCormack said, you have lost your good character today. I would argue, Judge Margaret McCormack, that you have lost yours. She said, I've also heard that because of your lack of understanding of English that you really didn't understand fully the regulations, but you are very clear of what is expected of you now. Romensi of Buckfast Avenue in Oldham was handed a £100 fine, £85 in court costs and a £32 victim surcharge. Metropolitan Police have been accused of racial profiling by a school pastoral support worker after being handcuffed and questioned. Dwayne Francis, who was detained whilst, we whilst waiting in his car for a post office to open en route to work, said young black men's negative experiences of police use of SOP and search in London has gotten worse during the coronavirus pandemic. His recollection of the incident in Lewisham on Wednesday morning has been shared thousands of times on Twitter and the Green Party's London mayoral candidate has pledged to raise the issue with Scotland Yard. He said, I was parked up when they drove past and then returned and demanded that I get off the phone and get out of my car. Francis said, despite showing them his work badge, the officers insisted he get out before one of them handcuffed him. He said they were from the Metropolitan Police's Territorial Support Group, which specialises in public order policing.
At all times, I remained calmed and explained why I was being unfairly treated and profiled. They attempted to claim that I had droplets of cannabis on the floor of my car, which was completely false. At one stage, one of them even said to me, do you know what this area is like? I told him not to be patronizing and that I had lived in the area for 32 years. I also explained to them that I work with young people on a daily basis and educate them about how they should be calm and also be sure of their rights in a situation like this. The officers showed a complete lack of disregard for me, an adult and a respected figure in the community, but how would a 15 or 16 year old handle a situation? Although he was allowed to continue on his way, the police provided no identification numbers and when he requested documentation for the search, he was simply told he could get it at a local police station. Sean Berry, the co-leader of the Green Party in England and Wales, who saw the post on Twitter, said, From start to finish, this incident raises serious questions. Most parts of the Met seem to be focused on engagement and constructive detection work with lockdown in place. Sounds like the TSG are just driving around at a loose end, exerting power over not-so-random citizens. A police spokesman said, Metropolitan police officers on proactive patrol to tackle crime in Lewisham spoke with a driver in a car parked on Rokeby Road at 9.41 on Wednesday 13th of May. The officers searched the driver and the car under the Misuse of Drugs Act. Nothing was found, the driver was not arrested and no further action was taken. Huh, well that's alright then. The driver was provided with details of the officer who conducted the search and informed that to gain a copy of the search record he would need to attend a police station as is standard protocol. I mean, I'm sure that statement is, of course, based on the constable's recollection of events, completely ignoring the concerns of the member of the public. Keep it up, Met. You are doing a fantastic job. West Midlands Police and Crime Commissioner Labour's David Jamieson has revealed exactly how and when police plan to enforce the new lockdown rules after branding the changes confusing. Now, remember that phrase, exactly how and when because I'm sure like me you'll still be scratching your head at the end of this too. Jamieson clarified that police would not be stopping small groups of people across the city to verify exactly who who they were socialising with but instead mass gatherings or large groups of people playing sport together would become the target of police action or those protesting or anyone else they don't like. Birmingham Live spoke to Mr. Jameson in a bid for clarity on how the police could and would enforce COVID-19 law. Now people are allowed to socially distance, chat with one person from another household. He said the changes made the police's job even more difficult during the crisis. What we've got now is so many different combinations of people who can be together, so it's really very complex for people to understand, he explained. By there not being one set of rules, it then makes it very difficult for the police to enforce it. My job is to hold the police accountable, doing a great job there. But what I want to know is precisely what I'm holding the force accountable for. It makes it very difficult for the officers. They're truly excellent, but they've got to know what the rules are to enforce them. There's a level of confusion. They didn't help last week by briefing out selectively to the media on the plans. But there were no briefings to people like myself on what to expect. I'm watching the TV to find out what's going on and what the police should be doing. For senior police officers to be sat around the television watching while the public are seeing at the same time is not a satisfactory way of running a country, especially during a crisis. But we need clear, unequivocal messages from the government on what we can and can't be done. Well, I'm pretty sure you would just do your job. You know, follow the law and legislation, forget the guidance and advice. Police have never been there to enforce people's advice. But isn't it convenient how you decide to start now? When asked if police will be asking everyone to verify who they're with, Jameson said, in theory, yes. But this is not what our police should be doing. We're tracking down the criminals. There is no real stomach for the police to be going out, checking every single group of people. It's not something police should be doing. Police would be having to go to people and say, who are you with? What's this person? Is this a relative? Do you live in the same household? It's difficult either with the time available or with the will available. Well, here's some advice for you, Jamieson. Don't. Don't waste your time and don't waste our taxpayers' money. 
that's still guidance and not law or legislation so you shouldn't even be considering it when asked when the police will intervene he said if large groups of people had gathered clearly flouting the rules then police will step in if masses of people are playing sport or massive groups of people are not self-isolating for social events then the police would step in personally i don't get what's so difficult about it stick to the law stick to legally processed legislation and leave the people to decide whether they accept and take the advice of the government simples staying in the west midlands now as reports have emerged of yet another police constable who's been suspended who's been suspended who's been suspended following allegations of excessive force this is in addition to Constable Redmist, who we discussed earlier. Last Thursday, a man in his 30s sustained a fractured ankle during his arrest in Digbeth, Birmingham, following reports of a theft at a shop in Allison Street shortly before 1.30 p.m. After reviewing the use of force, West Midlands Police suspended the constable and referred the matter to the IOPC, which has confirmed it is awaiting the referral. Now, if and when I get more info on this incident, I will, of course, let you know. Over the weekend, I posted a short video showing a young guy at Hyde Park being assaulted by police who were attending an anti-lockdown protest. Clearly, that wasn't the only incident that happened at Hyde Park, but was one that I was made aware of. In fact, the brother of Jeremy Corbyn <laughs> was one of the several posters, protesters arrested during a protest against the coronavirus lockdown. It was said that around 50 people defied social distancing advice at Speaker's Corner on Saturday, some holding placards stating anti-vax deserves a voice and freedom over fear. Dozens of paramilitaries in all their glory rocked up to show how they can enforce advice and one part of the health protection coronavirus restrictions regulations, in particular Regulation 7, which is the restriction on gatherings. That says during an emergency period, no person may participate in a gathering in a public place of more than two people, except where all the persons are members of the same household, where the gathering is essential for work purposes, to attend a funeral, where reasonably necessary to facilitate a house move, provide care and assistance to a vulnerable person, provide emergency assistance, or participate in legal proceedings or fulfill a legal obligation. I would say that we have a legal obligation to protest against things that aren't right. However, the Act, as far as I can tell, defies the Universal Declaration of Human Rights Articles 18, 19 and 20. Article 18 being that everyone has a right to freedom of thought, conscience and religion. Uh, obviously the freedom to change your religion or belief. Belief doesn't have to be about religion, you know, either alone or in a community with others and in public or private. Article 19, everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression, including freedom to hold opinions without interference. And Article 20, everyone has the right to freedom of peaceful assembly and association. Even our Human Rights Act 1988, Articles 9, 10 and 11. And let's not forget Article 4 of the Human Rights Act, no one shall be held in slavery or servitude, where servitude means the state of being a slave or completely subject to someone more powerful, i.e. the government and the police in this particular instance. Deputy Assistant Commissioner Lawrence Taylor, who is heading the Met's response to the COVID-19 pandemic said, with the easing of restrictions, we fully expected open spaces to be busy this weekend. He added, it was disappointing that a relatively small group in Hyde Park came together to, pro to protest the regulations in clear breach of the guidance, putting themselves and others at risk of infection. Officers once again took a measured approach and tried to engage the group to disperse. They clearly had no intention of doing so. And so it did result in 19 people being arrested and a further 10 being issued with a fixed penalty notice. But nothing about the people who were assaulted. Now, I don't necessarily agree with some of the theories people believe in, just as some of you won't always agree with my opinions on certain things. But do you know what? We have that right. We have a right to express our beliefs or not agree with other people's as laid out in the Human Rights Declaration and the Human Rights Act. Generally, 
only to be restricted if there is a national security risk, although the built-in caveats can be twisted to fit other government narratives. I've said it from the start of this so-called pandemic that even if there's a tiny chance that this virus can affect us or people we know, something like social distancing, in my opinion, can't be a bad thing. It's not infringing on our human rights just to socially distance. And it's always been advice, although some people took it as legally enforceable. So making that small adjustment isn't a major issue for me. And I watch this protest video and see people who are ignoring the advice, which of course is fine, but their defiance of it, protesting it's wrong and there is no violence, whilst wearing a face mask completely diminishes the arguments. And I know not everyone was wearing a mask, but it's like protesting against animal cruelty whilst wearing a fur coat. Can you see how that's not gonna get you taken seriously? In my opinion, the message would have been far greater and far more powerful if, if people were in fact in pairs, two meters apart from other pairs, or more if they're from the same household, taking up far more space, making it far more difficult for the police to police and giving them no reason to make the arrests under the health protection coronavirus regulations which unfortunately does state under Regulation 7 that during the emergency period, no person may participate in a gathering in a public place of more than two people, except for limited reasons. So the police were always going to go to these, these protests armed with that Section 7. Now, whether those regulations are actually lawful or not is another matter entirely, but the police will still act on that legislation because, let's face it, we are only following orders, mein Führer. We have to fight back using the same tools they use against us. It's the only way. Big thank you to channel Patreon supporters. Your support is truly, truly appreciated. Anyway, that's it for today. Please like, share, comment and subscribe. Let me know your thoughts as I know many of you will. And until next time, stay safe, look after each other, film the police and other officials. Good night all. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video. If you like the content and you'd like to help support the channel, you can do so. In the description of every video, there are some links to ways that you're able to help support the channel so I can continue putting out content. If you're unable to help us in that way, Hit that subscribe button up the top there if you haven't already become a subscriber that is support enough share the videos comment like it all helps if you're looking for something else to watch up top there is my latest video down the bottom there is a video that youtube recommends for you